Hey everyone, Mecha here. Welcome to the Fire Emblem 6 map tier list. I'm gonna rank all the maps in Fire Emblem The Binding Blade from best to worst. And in the end, let me know if you agree or disagree in any of these. Uh, I wanted to do this just to see if you guys would be into this kind of thing. And also, you know, I just encountered the map tier list somewhere and there were some takes I disagree with. So I'm gonna make my own. Um, I'm gonna be doing this mostly from my own perspective as an experienced player, but I'll try to factor in the experience of less experienced players. That's a lot of experience I just gave you there. You might have leveled up there. So I'll try to factor in maybe like Iron Man playthroughs, blind playthroughs, um, stuff like that. So uh, let's get into it. We got chapter one. I think this map is good for what it's supposed to do. Mostly when people talk about map design, they'll talk, oh, this map has a lot of side objectives. There's chests and villages and reinforcements. Chapter one is none of that, but it's still good because it's meant to introduce the player to what the game is like, what the units feel like, what the gameplay is like. It might be their first Fire Emblem, you know, the chance isn't very high, but it does exist, especially if you're in Japan. So in that sense, I think it's good. I think it's fine. And there's only one mild threat on a village uh, in the bottom right, the, the gold village. There's a brigand that starts like on that destroyed village. It's introducing the concept of destroyed villages. There's no way a player will not stop the brigand on his way there. And that's how you learn that you have to save villages. It's pretty good in that sense. Other than that, you don't really have to do anything. Maybe learn how the weapon triangle works and then you'll get through just fine. And considering like half your army can use swords or more than half, you should be good there. Next is chapter two, it introduces Deke and his fighters. It introduces you to kind of a two front fight where Deke takes enemies that come from near the throne area or the gate area. And while Roy and friends fight down to get to Deke and meet up with him and then they both bulos through the chapter together. Pretty simple concepts, but it does it pretty well. You learn how to take advantage of forts because you just put Deke on one and it destroys all the enemies, especially in your first playthrough. If you put Deke on a fort, he just one rounds everything there. Even on hard mode, he can do most of that, I think. But you also learn that like Deke on, by himself on a fort is not going to do everything. You'll want to push through with other units too. And that's where the rest of your army comes in. So again, it does a pretty good job. Again, I'm going to be pretty generous to the early game maps, even though by most standards, they wouldn't be the most outstanding maps ever. But for introducing concepts, it does pretty well. Uh, chapter three, I'm a bit less excited about. Chapter three, it has chat, so it's a reduction to thieves and chests, and you can get a couple more villages. But these are the, like, sure, this chapter has side objectives in two villages and two chests. But are they really side objectives? They feel more like walking simulators towards there. There's nothing threatening these things. There's no interesting strategy to get these houses, really. And overall, this chapter has a bit more walking than I would like. Uh, this is also when you start seeing reinforcements, and FE6 has ambush reinforcements, which I'm generally not a fan of. Most people are not, and I disagree with those people. Or I, I agree with those people. Damn, I just said I disagree with that. No. Uh, reinforcements, not great. Uh, a bunch of calves. You're probably not going to get surprised by the ambush reinforcements here. At least the game shows you how they work before threatening you with them, because they start all the way across the map, and so you have time to react to them. But overall, this map feels very slow. Uh, whoever goes to get Lou is pretty much just out of the action, can't go back in anymore. Uh, it's one of those things that Project Ember kind of fixed by introducing a breakable wall. I'm pointing to it. I know it's very small, the image here, but you know what I mean. The, that person just can't do anything for the rest of the chapter, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, it's it's kind of fine in how it introduces like multiple fronts attacking you, but other than that, I don't really like it that much. I'm gonna put it in like it's fine. It's it's all right. It, it's still not bad, uh, but it could be a lot more interesting, I think. Uh, maybe it's actually C tier. We'll see how we rank the other maps. Chapter four, uh, the Cav Deluge. Uh, this one in hard mode, it's a good example of where you really want to abuse Marcus because if your units do things by themselves, they get pretty much slaughtered. Uh, I guess getting a little more into um, what an experienced player does versus what a new player does. It has side objectives in villages that you got to rush for. It has some pirates, and I don't remember if this version has brigands in the north part. It hasn't been a while since I've played FE6, but that's part of why I wanted to do this tier list is to uh, remind myself of how the game is. Uh, but I know the bottom village is threatened, and you get a rope for saving it, so good reward versus good investment. Some reinforcements from the fort that you got to take care of, uh, like sending different people to different uh, objectives depending on the enemy type is like a good concept introduced here. You can choke point at the bridge, or you can advance. I gotta dock some points for the ambush spawns in this chapter. Um, two of them are really, really bad. One of them is the wave of cavaliers that appear behind you on hard mode and like turn 20. Not having time to react to that and like having seven move units spawn like four of them at the same time and just wrecking your face is so painful. Uh, sure, after 20 turns you'd expect the player to be out of that area, but at the same time, if you played normal mode, you wouldn't expect those reinforcements because they are hard mode only. And of course, the other one is Rutger appearing. Like, sure, it's telegraphed that he's going to appear on the battlefield sometime because he's like five back and forth dialogues between Clarine and Eric and Rutger. So you can tell the sense that something is going to happen. And sure, Clarine spawns from roughly his location. 
but god, <laughs> like, Rutger just kills you if you come too close, and it's pretty reasonable for a player to be out where Rutger spawns by the time he does. So that alone makes you want to put it down pretty far, but the rest of the map is kind of alright, so we'll give it a pass, we'll give it a C. It's not my favorite, but if I punished like every ambush spawn, all the map would be in C and D tier. I'm not gonna do that, I'm trying to rank these within FE6. Uh, next we got chapter 5. Uh, this is an interesting concept of reinforcements because if you open a door at the bottom here, you get a bunch of extra enemies, at least I think on hard mode. Uh, but if you don't, if you go a long way around, then you don't. Um, there's It's a bit too dense for my liking at the north and even at the south. Like It feels pretty bad to play and it kind of feels like you get bogged down a lot in this one. It's hard to really make an advance in this one. And it's just not a very interesting map. I don't think it's bad, but I think it's kind of average. Also, the village is like not under threat at all, so I don't even know why it's there. <laughs> like, if a village is not doing anything, then like if it's not under threat or anything at this point in the game, like in Chapter 5, I don't know if it doesn't really have to be there. It's, it's an okay map, I guess. It's fine. It doesn't have that many ambush spawns. They come in pretty late, and they're pretty much the same enemy type. It's a good training map, at least. That's good. Uh, chapter 6, the one with all the chests in all the corners, and Kath, and Sue, and another chapter where I'm like, yeah, there are side objectives, but it's really just waiting for Chad to get all the chests and waiting for Roy to go around to talk to Sue and talk to uh, Kath. It's interesting when you put a self-imposed challenge on yourself, like uh, an LTC run, for example. But if you don't, it's just a really slow chapter. And it also has some nasty ambush spawns in those rooms in the bottom. I don't think you get warned about them at all. If you just open the bottom rooms, I think for like two turns, nothing happens. And then on the third turn, enemies spawn and just attack you. It's very weird. Generally not a very big fan of blind rooms that you got to open a door to, I got to say. Um, this map is a nice breather, at least, in that the enemies are a lot weaker, and that is fine. But I'm going to go ahead and call it bad. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and call it bad. Chapter 7 is a very famous map for being very, very difficult. It's the map I have the most trouble with still to this day in FE6. The fact that you got to save Zealot and Trek and Noah, and uh, you got to get all the houses and stuff. This is one where I think the side objectives are mostly good because there is time pressure on to get them. Uh, even though the villages are not under threat of any kind, you do have to hurry up to beat the reinforcements from the south. And there is incentive to like, how do you want to divide your turns between killing enemies and getting houses? Usually you have enough people to where you can have some people visit houses and other people fight the enemies and still not be short on personnel. But it's an interesting puzzle at least. Trek and Zealot are often like called bad or like that element of the chapter is called bad because it's you have to rely on RNG to save them or so they say. I don't agree with that criticism because it's possible to recruit the zealot the turn he spawns and doing so while not trivial is an interesting puzzle to figure out and uh, I made it clear of chapter 7 that like a guide for it that kind of nearly guarantees you good results on turn 2 with zealot recruited and everything. And figuring out where to drop Roy and then how to protect him from the enemies is pretty interesting in my opinion. Sure, FE6 hit rates in this chapter feel really bad. Trying to hit like Cavaliers and Mercenaries and Wyverns with shaky hit rates can be pretty annoying. That's an FE6 problem more than a map design problem, but that does feel pretty punishing in this chapter, especially because one miss can just mean a failed clear. So I will dock some points for that in this chapter when time pressure and low hit rates combine. It feels very, very bad. But generally, I think the puzzleish design of the enemies in this chapter is interesting at the very least. I will say it's sometimes people will point to an element of a game as it's meant to like introduce you to a concept. And I've used that argument in this very video, but sometimes I think it's too far fetched for a player to be able to learn that concept. And the best example of, I think of that is to move AI in this game, where an enemy, usually enemies are divided into enemies that move directly. Like if, if they just stand still, and if you put in using a range, they will move and attack. Uh, alternatively, you have enemies that just stand still and don't move at all, and you have enemies that just roam around walking towards the nearest uh, player unit they can attack. That's usually the three AI types, but FE6 introduces a type that's like, okay, if I can reach you within two turns of full movement, then I will start moving, and otherwise I'll stand still. And one of the wyverns in this chapter has that AI, maybe even both, I don't remember, maybe even all three of them. Uh, the point is, it's kind of hard to pick up on that, because there's so much going on in this chapter that it's feels more like random when the wife starts moving and so you really have to do a lot of trial and error to figure that out and just kind of constantly make hypotheses and then test that one and see if it works and I don't think that's great design per se. This argument is usually used to defend FE12 map design, the prologue specifically, but I thought I would bring it up here because I think it comes up in map design every now and then. I don't really like that argument for 
weird obscure things. I think most of the game should tell these things directly to the player in some way through either a tutorial that breaks the fourth wall or a character that introduces that thing. So yeah, having said that, I think FE7 is all right. It's not my favorite map to play ever. I did enjoy figuring out a good turn two, turn one plan for it. So I'm gonna put it in fine for now. It's, I don't wanna say I like it because of all the problems with it, but I think it's a fine map overall for FE6. Uh, chapter eight is bad. No one likes chapter eight. It's just way too long of a winding corridor. It is a bit interesting how they combine that with a time-based objective with the thieves and Kath. And a lot of people will like kill Kath in chapter six, just to not have to deal with her and like thieves going for the chest in this chapter. I get that, but it's really not that bad. And it's kind of neat how it kind of teaches new players how to rescue drop to get units to f advance further when there's not too many enemies in the way. But at the same time, there's just way too much moving and walking in this chapter. Uh, this is another chapter where Project Ember introduces the breakable wall somewhere. I don't for, I don't remember where it is exactly, but it does save you a fair bit of time. And I like that change to this chapter a lot because it's just, it's the classic GBA walk uh, through a massive winding corridor that could have just been like 10 tiles shorter. And a lot of map space just feels wasted and empty. Uh, the reinforcements in this chapter at least are from like corners, but it's kind of annoying when they spawn in your face and just kill you and you can't really do anything about it. At least Wendy and friends warn you about the ones coming for them. So that's kind of neat, I suppose. Uh, Adax is also bad because it has the same winding corridor problem, but it also has lava pits between every turn, wasting even more of your time. It's a good training map if you're using like an unleveled unit like uh, OJ or Lena or someone like that. And for that purpose, it's fun to train. I guess at this point, it's only right that I mentioned Henning and other bosses. Boss killing in general in FE6 is an unreliable affair that I do not enjoy a whole lot, but it's only a small portion of what playing map actually entails. It's usually the last thing you do after everything else is done, and usually you're not doing it on a timer, so I'm not going to weigh it in too heavily here. But yes, for the record, Henning sucks. I hate him. Chapter 9, Western Isles. It's pretty fine. I don't like Fog of War in general in FE6. I feel like you don't really get enough torch stabs to really enjoy playing it at like I enjoy torch staff grinding but I don't enjoy dealing with fog of war a whole lot at least you get three thieves in this game two of them fairly early and enough torch items even viable torch items to deal with it so I don't think it's a huge knock but I'm not a big fan of it chapter nine is fine uh, I'm just gonna throw it in B tier uh, it has a couple of villages to visit that are under threat from pirates one thing that I've never really heard anyone discuss about fe6 and like games in general with villages it's kind of hard to tell whether a bandit or a pirate or a thief is going for villages or whether they will attack you or, you know, there's just regular enemies. So I think some kind of visual distinction is needed. This is something that ROM hacks, for example, can do. Souls of the Forest has little flags on enemies that tell you what their AI is like. And I think that's something that's really missing from FE6. Uh, not that I blame it too much because it is a fairly old game at this point. Just something that fan games, I think, do better than, you know, mainline Fire Emblem games. Uh, chapter, I want to say this is chapter 10... B. <laughs> yeah, this is the B route chapters. Again, images are a little bit small, so it's a little bit hard to tell for me. Uh, 10B is a lot like 11A. Uh, this, it has almost the same uh, objectives like villages, Klein, Tate, you know, the, the drill. Thea is her name also. I remember this one being significantly worse. I don't exactly remember why. It's been a long time since I went B route, but I thought this map was okay when I played it. A little bit hard, a little bit hectic. Uh, not as good as 11A, but still like fine. So I'm gonna throw it in here. It could be better than this. I don't know. I haven't played it in a while. Uh, 11B, I do remember being fairly obnoxious. There's a long distance to walk. Uh, the ballista that's between all the mountains is fairly obnoxious to deal with. Saving the villains from across the map is challenging, but I don't remember it being particularly unfair. Um, that village where geese is, it's kind of whatever, whatever. Nothing really happens there. I don't think it's another significant threat. Recruiting geese is pretty much trivial. I guess it's annoying that you have to get Roy from one place to another. Um, some would call it annoying, some would call it, you know, interesting exercise in planning, but I don't really like how that ballista limits what you can do in this chapter, generally speaking. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah there we go. <laughs> um, we got chapter 10A. This one's more relaxing. Like, so far, I haven't really had any chapters that I love, love, love so far. Uh, this one is fine. It doesn't really have a whole lot going on. Again, the village is not really under significant threat. It's just Gonzalez going for that village, but you wanted to recruit him anyway, and it's not particularly challenging to get Lena over him. I guess one bad thing about FE6 that I could mention here is it's kind of annoying to remember to deploy units that you never normally use just to recruit someone. A bit of a problem with 9, getting uh, Fear with Noah, getting 
uh, Sin with Sue. There are some hints that you should do it very vaguely, but it usually involves playing the chapter first and then figuring it out and then resetting, which for a blind player seems like a bit of a pain. And similarly for this one, it's easier to forget to bring Lulina to bring to get Gonzalez. Uh, but yeah, whatever. Um, let's throw this one. I, I think this one is fine, but not particularly interesting. It's fine. Okay, it's fine. I just said it. I guess I'm not really ordering within the tiers. I forgot to do that, but you know, whatever. Uh, 11a, this is the chapter I think that most people like. And this is the first one I'm going to throw in love with. I don't know if you know that there's going to be any others. This is the best map by far. It's got a lot of side objectives with significant drawbacks if you don't meet them. Uh, like, the villages each and of themselves have good items in them. Almost every one of them is good, like stat boosters, promotion items, etc. But in addition, if you save all of them, you get a hero crest. That's a good incentive to save every single one of them and doing it in a timely fashion because most of them are under threat from bandits coming from the mountains fairly quickly. And you've got two different routes you can go uh, from the, the... Your army starts united, but you want to split them up yourself. One of them goes through the wall in the north to break it down. You have a little niche for Geesh there with his Brave Axe. Uh, or you can go down uh, the normal path, probably want to bring Clarine there to get Klein, then Klein has to get Tate. And if you... It's it's very rewarding to play this chapter well, because if you clear out enemies fast, and you manage to get to your side objectives quickly, then you have so much time to ferry Klein over to where Tate is going to be, that you can just recruit her almost instantly, and her Pegasus are never in any danger. However, if you falter somewhere, if you get stuck behind a choke point for too long, then you might have to end up with dealing with multiple enemies. And if you take way too long, then you're also going to deal with cavaliers from the north that appear from the starting point. On this chapter, because you're so incentivized to move fast, I don't really have an issue with these cav spawns. Um, neither are the ones that come from the south later with the mini boss, because they take so long to spawn, and by the time that you uh, would have to deal with them, you're going to have evacuated the starting points. No questions about it. You can't afford to leave someone behind. You don't even want to. There's no reason to. Whereas in chapter 4, units were in like significantly more danger if they went forward. So it makes sense to leave someone like, I don't know, Ellen or maybe units you're not really using because they're force deployed, but you don't really care about giving them XP. So in that sense, it's, it's easier to get overwhelmed by random reinforcements. Where in this one, it doesn't really matter. The one knock I have on this chapter that might keep it out of S tier <laughs> is Echidna. Uh, Echidna spawning a bunch of like enemy fighters on the same turn is really really bad the fact that she can theoretically die instantly on like turn 11 on any phase is a huge crime i do think ai manips to prevent this are underrated and a reasonable solution to this something like it's not too hard to find a character that can survive a hit but it's more frail than echidna i think echidna dies in two hits it might be three i think it's two two fighters should kill her and she has the steel axe equipped so she can you know get killed really easily yada 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 it's annoying but if you have, let's say, um, any unit with lower HP and defense and the same weapon challenge situations, even someone with weapon challenge disadvantage, so with like just have a lance equipped, if you just put them in a spot where they can only get attacked by one fighter, that fighter will almost definitely go for them. You can do this with multiple units uh, in different directions, and then the fighters will definitely go for them, and then you're safe. Like someone like Roy has higher priority for attacking than a kid, I'm pretty sure. So those just go for Roy. Roy is usually not in any danger as long as he got some supports nearby. Even if he doesn't, he should be able to find to survive one X, X fighter. And a kitten survives no problem. This is something a new player is never going to remember to do. Like, why would you position units near a village that's not even visitable? Um, it's kind of trash. So it's still the crash design, but it's not bad enough for me to leave it out of S tier. And I, I'm a little worried that if I don't put this, this map in S tier, I don't think my standards are just too high for FE6. But I will say this is not the game that I think has the best map design ever, but it's fine. So yeah, I think 11A overall is a great chapter. And the other knock I have on, on this chapter, which is not really designed as much as just faulty programming, is Klein and Tate having a, I want to say, 10% chance to not move at all on any given turn. And that sounds not so bad, but when their friends have to survive in order for you to get the promotion items they're associated with, that's pretty bad because if they end up too far behind the others, then your other units are going to have to face attacks by the NPCs, potentially kill them if you have the wrong weapons equipped. They're very suicidal. So it's really much easier to recruit Tate and Klein without any casualties on either end if they just move every turn. And the fact they have the random chance not to move is very bad. I'm going to go ahead and call that one a bug that's not intended, and so it doesn't really factor into design, but it is pretty bad. Next, we have chapter 12. I think this one is inoffensive and slightly interesting. I like the... I'm usually not a big fan of forced split deployments, but in this one, at the very least, you have control over who goes where, unlike, say, in FE5. And in this one, at the very least, it makes... You have mostly 
visible what you need to do on every side because there's almost no reinforcement in this chapter. The only ones that appear are very late. So there's also no ambush reinforcements to worry about in this one. And you got Kath to recruit with Roy. Um, Ray is very uninteresting. You just move Chad until Chad recruits him or Lou if you want to. Uh, the little archer runway in the middle is interesting. It's one of the few spots in FP6 where I actually advocate for using javelins and hand axes because you're not going to counter the other ways. Uh, it's a little bit annoying to get someone through that corridor, and it, it's a bit it's a bit too much walking in this chapter, but not so much that I find it annoying. It's generally interesting. Uh, it gives you a chance to use your archers, especially Klein. Um, the chests are mostly not super interesting because if you just move a thief towards them, you'll get them every time before any other enemy thief gets to show up. But you do have to beat Kath to the top chests, I suppose. I don't know, I think this comic is kind of neat. I kind of like this one. It's a bit of an underrated chapter. I never really hear anyone talk about it. It also has a side objective that makes you go faster, which is the guide in chapters. For eight, that was pretty much trivial, like just keep Lena alive, Lamau. But for these, that actually makes the chapters a bit more interesting to me, is giving a casual player a bit more incentive to move fast, even if they don't have to. The chapter doesn't explicitly tell you to do this, so it's very easy to miss the guidance if you are someone who just takes your time with chapters. So that's kind of annoying, but at the same time, I think there are some dialogue hints that going faster would be better for you. And so at least on replays, you can get the guy in the chapters. I don't generally knock on FE6's true ending system too much. And I think in this chapter, it's fine. It's also the only way to see reinforcements, I think, is to wait a long time. So again, no reinforcements is a big plus for this one because there's no ambush spawns. And Kath makes it a little bit more interesting. I guess the sleep staffs are a bit annoying, but you can AI manip or you can bring a restore staff to the groups. So you can make sure that people always have a staff body near them. So yeah, I don't have any big issues with this chapter. It's also funny how the boss switches three times, but it doesn't really impact things too much. Next, we have 12x. Uh, I don't like this chapter too much. There is too much fog. <laughs> I mean, fog itself would be okay, but between that and the poison vents wasting my time and them firing off, even if there's no one in range, it's pretty boring. Uh, a lot of the chests are just trolls. There's like a there's like a chest with a chest key or a door key inside it, which I find funny, but also very stupid. Uh, there's like a killer axe somewhere in the dark I don't like, and generally getting the thieves. One thing I do like is that it feels like the fastest way, the best way to get all the treasure in this chapter is to beat all the enemy thieves to the chests. But there'll there'll be some chests that you just can't beat them to, and that get that loses you the treasure if you don't get to the thieves in time because they outmove most of your units. That seems very difficult to do, but it turns out their escape point is at the starting point, so you can just camp them out and then get them, you know, like wait for them to come to you and then just take their stuff and kill them. It's a nice source of uh, extra lockpicks for extra money. So yeah, I, uh, it's it's not terrible, but I don't like it a whole lot. I'm gonna put it in uh, eh, whatever tier. I also don't really like the berserker boss that can just crit you and end your run if he feels like it. Uh, I think there's also like an effective weapon somewhere, but I might be misremembering that. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I think there's too much walking around and not too much going on in this chapter. 13, this is an interesting chapter, uh, the, 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 big, 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 the big bridge. I like that there is a lot of pressure on you to go fast. Maybe if you want to, first of all, here in normal mode, that's something you might want to push for. Um, that's kind of it, isn't it? Is there anything else pushing you? Oh, the reinforcements from the back. Those are pushing you forwards. I do like those. It's annoying that the ambush spawns, but once you've seen one wave, you've probably, you probably roughly know what's, what to expect at the very least. And you're probably kind of used to reinforcements being ambush spawns by this point in the game. So it could be worse. There's worse examples of ambush reinforcements than this chapter. I enjoy that you can just leave someone like Gonzalez behind on the peaks and just let him uh, fight all the cavaliers while everyone else just takes their time. Uh, but if you're just rushing away from enemies with more movement than you, I think that adds a lot of excitement to the chapter. And there's also an armory that you want to visit near the end of the chapter with killer weapons that also takes an extra turn to visit. And of course, you also got to get a basket over there. You get to try out Milady in this chapter. Uh, training her can be a lot of fun because she's only level 10, so she gains rapid XP. If you give her a horse layer, she just one-shots a bunch of enemies. That is good fun. Is that necessarily great design? I don't know, but it feeds dopamine into me. Uh, I enjoy that part a whole lot. The enemy formations are a bit tricky in this chapter. There's like longbow snipers and mages that might two-shot a lot of your units. There's some act reavers and killer weapons about that you have to maneuver carefully around. Interesting enemy compositions for sure. A bit tough. Like it's definitely a hard chapter to beat. It's one of the more underrated ones in difficulty. I've been saying that for a long time now, but I still think it holds true. There's one knock I have in this chapter. Uh, there's two. One of them is there's not really anything interesting to do with side objectives. You generally don't want to recruit Percival in this chapter if you're playing on hard mode. And even if you are not, then it's just easier to wait for Percival. You don't really get a lot of value out of having him in Chapter 14. So it's really just for 14x that you recruit him early. So besides that, there's two villages, but they're not under any threat. Visiting them just takes one of your units one turn to get in there and get out real quick. It's not super exciting. So 
it's really just the core of getting to the end of this chapter that makes it interesting. And fortunately for this map, it is quite interesting. One thing I haven't really talked about for FE6 is that every map is C's and that might seem monotonous, but I honestly think chapters are defined way more by their side objectives and exactly what's going on than the way you end the chapter. In fact, usually people play maps similarly, regardless of what the end goal is, they just save that end goal for the very last thing because they can't do things in a chapter anymore. The end goal becomes something to delay rather than something to strive for. So in that sense, I think side objectives are way more defining. Uh, for the chapter, yeah, chapter 13, I like it just fine. The other knock I have on it that I forgot to mention is that the camera keeps going back and forth between different enemy formations because the order in which the enemies move is not this whole army moves and then this other army moves. Instead, it's like, okay, this cavalier from group A moves and the cavalier from the other side of the map moves. And it just creates a nauseating back and forth camera that makes enemy faces take way too long. That's a nitpick though, not really super uh, deep. So we'll throw this in ATR. I like this map. Chapter 14, slightly controversial take. I like this chapter personally. I think it's fine. Uh, I think if you're an informed player on Chapter 14 Arcadia, then you're going to be just fine. You have a lot of tools at your disposal to deal with it. The chapter becomes interesting. There is so much going on that is interesting to divert units to. And I enjoy playing this map every time I get to it. Most people, especially blind players, will not share that perspective. And that's also totally fine. For a new player, you're thrown in the middle of a desert. Most of your units that you've been using have like one, two, or three movements. And there's a sleep guy putting your guys to sleep. There's wyverns coming out of the fog that you could not see coming anywhere. There's mannequins hidden in the fog that can just want to kill your units. You got to get treasure. You got to look up a map to find all the treasure somewhere. Uh, you got to bring thieves to get that treasure. Uh, there's bandit reinforcements with two berserkers that can just one-shot units. There's one of them with a halberd. So if you have any horses stuck down there, they're just completely screwed. It's not, it's nothing that makes a map feel good to play for a new player. And I respect that. So if it was a new player, this goes in D, no questions asked. For me, I think this chapter is fun because what I do in this chapter is I let myself use the desert item manipulation trick, which is not intended, but it does make the game more fun. It means I don't have to deploy thieves to get desert items. I just use mages instead or flyers, and those can get the objectives, objectives done very quickly. And in addition, someone like Sophia becomes more valuable because she can pick up items and run around um, before she has to go get the guiding ring near the oasis. And in the same way, I can deploy like base level Shanna. I can deploy like base level Ray or Lou. I can use Ellen to heal my units. I will have to bench someone like Clarine. Uh, I also get to use my waifu Cecilia because she's only has two moves, but still enough to keep up with most of your units because Roy's got to get the need in anyway. And Cecilia might as well accompany him. Cecilia is able to restore people that got put to sleep or silenced. She's able to heal people if they get hurt. She can do some chip damage with her caliber. I know exactly where the wyverns are, and I know they have, uh, I think the top ones have one move AI, so they just move if you get in range, and the bottom ones, the bottom right ones, they have two move AI, so you can kind of bait them. Uh, I enjoy setting up a play where I pick up the warp staff in the bottom right corner right before I seize, that way I don't have to deal with the enemies there. All that stuff requires some precision timing, tactics, planning, etc. that I enjoy. So I think Arcadia is good, but most people probably don't, and I respect that, uh, but I'm going to throw it an A. I think this map is fine and fun. Uh, it does really hurt your team composition. Like if you were someone who wants to bring the same team of units to every single chapter, then this one is not going to be according to your tastes. I respect that, but again, it's not the way I play. I like to deploy the best units or the units I want to use in every chapter individually. I don't really have a core team that I want to stick to for every chapter. So in that sense, Arcadia also works fine for me. But again, if you're someone who likes using generals or the paladins or fighters, warriors, those really get scuffed by the sand and that sucks. Uh, next, we got 14x. It's uh, it's a guy in a chapter, and it's not a very great one. Uh, the it's the disappearing tiles are very annoying. I did enjoy this in my last playthrough because I actually tried to go fairly fast without warp skipping, and so having to set up tactics with rescue dropping was fairly interesting. But I don't really enjoy the massive bolting overlap in the middle of the map. It's the sages, especially because FE6 doesn't let you see exactly how far they can attack. Instead, you have to come to squares because the game. When you check the range, the game pretends that they can move around and have six move, but they really have zero. And so trying to see exactly where you can get attacked is very tedious. Also, if you get stuck in the water with someone, and you have no flyer or berserker deployed, they're just stuck there forever. That sucks. So all these are not great factors. Also, the disappearing tiles is another one of those FE6 guiding gimmicks that just takes forever to resolve. And uh, there's not too much going on in the chapter that really redeems that. There's no side objectives to go for. Um, no super interesting formations or anything to work with. It's just a bunch of mostly unpromoted enemies. Uh, I don't think it's, this one is outright bad, but I think this one is not very good either. Uh, 15, it's chill, it's fine. It's uh, It's got Garrett, it's got Percival, but neither of them is super interesting to recruit. Percival just kind of runs at you, he just 
put your dancer near where he's going to end up on turn two, and then you just recruit him. So that's whatever. Garrett at least makes you rush a little bit. The enemy formation is interesting. There's like a bunch of snipers and mercenaries and Valkyries that is kind of like an unusual mix of enemies, especially Valkyries are rarely seen in FA6. So having to deal with those fast uh, mounted magical enemies is new. Other than that, not much going on. The, the seize point being so close to the starting point with the flyer is an odd choice for sure, especially because you got the warp staff two chapters ago and you got a really overpowered flyer a couple chapters ago as well. Not the greatest design choice, I think. Uh, I guess they thought with a bunch of snipers they could protect it, but they really can't. And so if you don't care about Garrett, then you just skip that. I guess you do lose out, lose out on a hammer and staff, which is an interesting side objective. If you do try to clear this fast while also getting Garrett and a hammer, then things get slightly more challenging. Most people will probably just get Garrett and a uh, hammer and then go around the long way. And that way, the chapter, I think, is fine. Not particularly exciting, but pretty fun. Uh, nice breather chapter between Arcadia and the hell that is chapter 16. Chapter 16, I think, is a map that on paper would be rated very highly because of the high count of enemy objectives that you have to do. Uh, there's just a lot to do in the chapter, but quantity and quality are not the same. So the first thing you got to do is keep Douglas alive, and he's an enemy. He's going to keep hitting you uh, whenever he can with the Silver Axe. So you want to find some source to distract him or put him to sleep or lock him in a chest room behind Larum or Elfin, who he won't attack. All that is, is okay, interesting for a short time. The problem is everything else in this chapter takes so long to do that that objective alone makes the map so, so tedious. The chapter has chests, um, but they're not really under a threat of anyone, especially if you've already recruited Kath. Even if you have recruited Kath, it's kind of trivial to get someone over there um, to grab her in time with Roy. I'm assuming at this point, at least you've talked to Kath twice with Roy. Uh, but usually I've already recruited her by chapter 12. So for me, um, there's like no thieves in this chapter as far as I recall. And besides that, your own thieves just have to walk through the chests and open them up. And then you got to get Milady to where Zeus is in the corner. And you got to have Roy talk to you and pay him a bunch of golds because you feel like you have to recruit all the characters. And there's just, it, it just takes so long. There's way too many winding corridors that you got to walk through. It's, the chapter just takes more long. It, it just really overstays its welcome. It's not a whole very fun chapter. And even if you deploy two thieves, you just really don't have enough to get everything in a fairly timely fashion. Every time I play this chapter, I end up having a bunch of dead turns where I'm just walking my thief uh, to Narshan or to a chest somewhere in a corner to try and get everything. I do think this chapter is really interesting LTC clears, but I'm not really factoring that in. I think this map takes too long. It has okay design overall, but none of the objectives individually are very challenging or interesting. There's just a lot of them and they take a long time. So... I don't know if I want to call it bad, because I, I do appreciate the things it does well. I just don't think there are too many of them. So I'm going to throw it in there. <laughs> Probably my hottest take, besides Arcadia. Uh, 16x, this one takes too long. There's too many enemies. It's fun to warp skip, at least, because it's not trivial. The Berserk Staff is very annoying to deal with. You don't really have a lot of counterplay besides either uh, the, the Fa trick, the AI manipulation trick that I've explained in a lot of other videos and I'm not going to get into. Uh, but the Falling Arrows take a long time. Um, walking through the map takes a long time. Most of the enemies are passive. At some point they become aggressive, that's like turn 30, and even then it doesn't make the map magically interesting. Uh, a lot of long-range bullshit to deal with that's very tedious to check. I do enjoy the little sage in the middle of the map, though, like taking him out with a longbow feels very satisfying. But besides that, yeah, it's an FE6 Gaiden. 17 Ilya is interesting, because you got a long way, you can go around the lake at the, the bottom, and that path is not super challenging, but it's fine. And then at some point you got a sandbar that appears between the up from the starting points and basically the end point of the chapter. That is fine. Like I don't, there's nothing offensive about this chapter. There's no side objectives to do, but it's just a it's just a fine chapter. I don't really mind this one, but there's not too much to say about it. It's just kind of there. <laughs> there's no, there's not even any new recruits. I don't remember. All right, the chapter's fine. Uh, it's a 17 CK. That's. I mean, this map, I barely have any memory of it. It's Fog of War that I think is kind of boring. I think it's the only map where thieves are destroying enemy villages or enemy thieves are destroying villages other than like, no, this is it, I think. Uh, besides this, it's usually brigands, but here it's thieves for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, a bunch of nomads, a um, couple wyverns, a couple myrmidons probably. I don't have great memories of this chapter. I thought it was all right, but Fog of War only lets you go so far. Uh, this is the next Ilya chapter. I think we're at 18 now. Um, this is a bunch of forests. This is the frozen lake. At some points, Nime freezes the entire map's waters, and so you can walk over the rivers. Uh, interesting concept for sure. Uh, unfortunately, you're slowed down by like a chapter 4 FE4 Silesia level 
of forest everywhere that just makes everything take too long. It does let you use flyers a bit more, but it's basically a desert map disguised as forest. It's It takes a bit too long for my liking, and there's not much else going on. I guess getting the villages is sort of interesting, but there's... I, I like the leniency on getting the villages. The brigands aren't too close starting to it. Uh, but there's like too many ranged enemies on this map. It just takes so long to trudge through. I don't really enjoy this map, but I can't really call it bad because I don't hate it. Like I don't, when I think of bad FE6 map, I think of these. I don't really think of this one. So I'm gonna throw it in uh, C tier as well. Sakai, uh, this is the this is one of the most Sakai maps of all time. You got the little tents that you gotta seize in the middle and a bunch of tents around. And I think once you enter that zone with one unit, uh, a random amount of nomad troopers spawn from the tents and attack you. That's horrible. Why would you do that? This is a terrible design, uh, especially because Roy at this point is probably, even if you raise him, is locked at level 20, can't promote this. He'll probably dice at two Nomad Troopers. There's not too much counterplay to it. Uh, you don't really want to have like a diamond of units surrounding Roy. That takes like, counting real quick, like nine units or something to do. That's so much. Uh, yeah, bad map. Don't like it. It's also just open with no terrain or anything besides the river between you and most enemies. It's I don't like this one. This is 19 Ilya. Uh, this one has Fog of War as well. This one is sort of interesting because using your Thief Vision usually conflicts with like Ballista Ranges and other dangerous enemies getting in your way. Some Status Staffs I think are there, like a Sleep Staff. I don't really like this one too much, but I do think it's at least somewhat interesting. So I'm going to throw it like in C tier. I think it's okay. Uh, but the enemy formation, there's like a couple Pegasus that just move around randomly, which is very awkward to deal with if you're trying to plan a playthrough. It's not really an offensive chapter to me, but it does feel very tedious to play. The only upside, really, is that you have Nime in this chapter, and she's very, very good and very fun to use. Uh, this is 20 Sake. Uh, I don't think this one has any super offensive reinforcements, but I might be wrong. I think they mostly come from like the starting point. I don't remember any uh, in, in the zone. This is 19, right? Yeah, 19 Sake. Uh, this one is okay. It's fine. I don't really have any great... Cons to this. I do think hitting nomads is a bit annoying in FE6, but that's not really a map design issue, more on an enemy design issue, which I guess coincides with map design, but not entirely. I'm gonna throw it here for B tier for now, it's fine. Uh, next up, we got. Ooh, it's 20 Ilya. It's getting cold in here. Uh, this map is hard. Like, this map is really annoying because there's a lot of status tabs and not a whole lot of room to get to them. They're, they're, behind, they're behind a bunch of en enemies that you can't. Just kill in one round, usually speaking. I guess like Percival and Lady could, but that's about it. And so you're constantly getting berserked. The way I usually play this is I end up soaking the status stabs with someone, restoring them, or having Faye dodge them, and then play on, which is not very interesting. Uh, the the chests inside, kind of annoying that they're in ballista range, and so your thief needs to be able to survive ballista shots, or you gotta wait out the ballista shots. I usually just wait out the ballista shots. There's probably faster ways to play this, but usually my playthroughs of this map end up being tedious. I also don't like how. The game is trying to tell you, like, hey, you should totally free Yuno from her cell with Zealot. And you let the civilians go, because the easiest way to get the side objectives for the civilians and get the Angelic Robe is to just leave them in their cell. So on the last turn before you seize, you open the door, talk to Yuno, and then seize. Um, but the way the game encourages you to open the door instead by kind of... Like, usually when you see a prison, you want to free the people inside it, right? So the way that the, the best place to do the opposite doesn't really jive with me. I don't want to call it bad, but I kind of do want to call it bad. Uh, we'll throw it in DT here and we'll see what the comment section has to say about it. Uh, this is 20 Sake. Uh, or I think this is, yeah, this is 20 X Sake. Is it? No, that's the other one. This is, yeah, this is 20 X. This is just 20 Sake. This one also has Fog of War. Uh, Ballistas and Fog of War. In this setting, where you can't really escape them very well, not great. There's not too much going on in this chapter. It's been a long while since I've played the Sake maps, but I really don't remember liking this one very much. Sake is. Uh, is a hellhole for sure. I think there's like a bunch of bolting sages in the middle too. Like this chapter is just tedious as fuck. I hate this one. Uh, <clears throat> 20x Ilya. 20x. Uh, this one is just boring. Nothing happens. If you end turn, your units get status and then nothing else happens. <laughs> you need to break through a bunch of 50 HP walls. And it's kind of fun to use Eclipse to do that. But other than that, there's not really anything to like here. Also, the way your units are split in three. This is... It's annoying. It takes so long to get through this map. If the most fun way to play it is to warp skip it, you know something is wrong. Next up, um, Sakai. But if you thought RNG for random nomad troopers and tents was bad, how about you have to seize a tent, but we don't tell you which one is randomly generated. That's just awful. Fuck that shit. And the bosses on the thrones here are also so bad. Oh, I just, I just remembered. Um, the one city map has gel on the throne. Hold up, we gotta lower this one by a tier. Gel is so bad. Get out of here. Sorry. Um, so if you don't like dealing with, with Kel, the Swordmaster on the throne, how about you deal with 
but uh, the druids aren't so bad because no map troopers on thrones are just uh, awful. And you kill them and you seize, and the map could be over, but you could also be facing a bunch of reinforcements from the tents around you. It's randomly generated. It's awful. Let's fuck this chapter. 21. This one is peak map design. I like this one. A uh, bunch of reinforcement zones. And if you don't know the reinforcement zones, then you get an epic battle where you fight a bunch of enemy wyverns, and it really feels like Burn's last stand. Well, they still got a couple more chapters to go, but it really feels like one. And I had a ton of fun playing this one casually. Once I figured out the reinforcement zones, that you can skip all of them but the last one, it still got more interesting because now I have to worry about ferrying my units across the lines using flyers and warp staves and rescue staves and dancers and trying to get to the secret shop to buy all the boots, which is also a huge plus to <laughs> FE6, it's just a buyable boot shop. The one bad thing I still hate is the ambush reinforcements nature, of course. Especially near the secret shop, I think the... I think if you trigger zone 4 at the bottom right, then enemies show up around the secret shop and that gets you killed a lot of the time. But that should have been better planning on my part. I'm going to take the L for that one. Um, yeah, buying stuff and also selling stuff at the start of the chapter is very easy with Merlinus, so... Um, it kind of takes away the inconvenience that FE6 has where you can't buy things in the, in the battle preps. So at least that part is fairly easy to do as well. I enjoy playing this map. I'm going to put this one in S tier 2. Uh, 21x is very boring. You can either warp skip it by lighting up the fog and just warping someone in the middle here. They might die if they're not super strong like Percival is, but if they live, then you get to kill the boss early in the chapter, which is probably the best way to play it, because the alternative way is to go the long way around and deal with chests that can randomly have mana keats, which at least is funny, but ugh, why the RNG in objectives, dude? And the other thing is the traps in this chapter, the traps, air quotes. Uh, if you step between, I think it's like around here somewhere, then there's a... Uh, there's like a little spear that comes out of the wall that deals like 10 or 15 base damage. And if you have, and it it goes, it doesn't pierce your defense. It just does an attack for that much. And most of you will probably have 10 or more defense. So completely trivial, boring chapter. Don't like it. I see a pattern here with the guy in chapters, by the way. 22, I think from here on out, it's very contingent. How much you like the maps depends on whether you got boots from the secret shop. I remember I thought this chapter was very tedious when my units had 5, 6, or 8 move, but once I started getting boots from the secret shops, I started enjoying this bit a bit more because all these long corridors were traversable within one or two turns. Even with units with like two pairs of boots, they could still get through in corridor with like one turn, which makes the map as fast paced as you want it to be. And you can also use warp to skip a lot of the things. At this point in the game, you have a lot of tools at your disposal. This is something that F6 does very well, I think giving you a lot to work with. You have Warp, you have Hammer to repair that. The Warp doesn't have infinite range, but it has enough range with Nime or Yoder, where you can get almost anywhere you want with a little bit of um, juggling of resources. Apocalypse increasing Warp probably was unintentional, but still works very well on this map. You have Silence and you have Sleep to disable enemy status staff users. You have um, a rescue staff to get people out of trouble. Uh, you have Physic to heal them. You have the Holy Maiden or the Saint Staff to cure status staffs. So most of the things the game throws at you are solvable. It's almost like Thracia at this point. So I do like that. And the one... I also like that you have to send units to multiple objectives. So far, it's usually been Roy ends the map. But here, there's no throne for you to seize until Roy is at the entrance of the throne room. And you have two people on the switches in the corners. So you basically have a three-way seize going on. And then you got to get to the final throne room. So I like that little trick you have to do. The throne room I'm not a super big fan of because how difficult it is kind of depends on what turn it is. And it's, it's kind of like RNG to generate reinforcements almost. There's reinforcements coming from the stairs. I think on every turn, divisible by four, if I'm not mistaken, or like every three turns, every four turns. And so depending on when you open the door to the throne room, it could be the easiest throne room of your life or it could be a hell. And because they're ambush spawns, you don't really have a willy way. And because this game doesn't have like any kind of save system, you could just get wiped out with very little control over the matter. Fortunately, you do start the throne room far away enough from the stairs where you can play very cautiously to stop it if you know what's going to happen. But if you don't, it's kind of mean, I think. And the enemies in the throne room are also highly tough, but I would not expect any less from basically a final boss. So I enjoy this map personally, and I enjoy throwing everything I have at this map. But if you hated it, probably because you didn't have enough boots to make things go by faster, I totally understand. But I'm going to throw it in S tier. I think it's an epic conclusion to the main game. Now, if you got all the Guidance chapters, you got all the weapons, and you still have them around, you get three more maps in this game. I'm not going to really go into that system. You can debate about whether it's good or bad all you want. Um, I think it's fine, for the record, but that's not what this video is all about. Chapter 20, I want to say this is 23. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, no reinforcement in this one. That's cool. Instead, what you see is what you get with the, with the enemies. You could say that the enemy status tabs on this map are very obnoxious, and I would probably agree with you. 
uh, near the throne room, there's a bunch of druids with ambiguous AI that can sleep, or I think there's a sleep or two and a berserk and then maybe a silence, but I'm not sure about the last one. Normally, I'd say this is too much for a small area to contain, but because you have the Saint Staff and you likely still have it when you get to this point, I don't think I want to kind of as a big knock against it. Even if four or three people get status, you just have a one way, you have a one button with limited uses, but still enough to get by. Like, even if you if you save the Saint Staff for just this chapter, you could soak all those uses and just clear it out in three turns if you want to. Alternatively, the way I like to do it is to have you Bunga in there and uh, use the one turn the Saint Staff gives me to wipe out all the enemies there. Uh, but that requires a more sophisticated approach than I'm able to explain in a short video. Short but mecha standards anyway. Uh, other than that, you got a bunch of wyverns, but by this point it's fairly... You would probably know how to deal with wyverns and manakeets and druids that are just roaming around the map, so... That part isn't the most interesting, but there's still it's still an interesting location for a battle. Uh, there's one village, it doesn't really matter. I don't like too much that it's just a character that only joins if you have either Fear or Bartra able to recruit him, especially because Bartra is also route exclusive. I respect that they tried that, it's very funky, but I don't think that's the way you want to distribute your Karel, especially because he's kind of supposed to be a Goto-like character that saves you at the end. So... Yeah, I don't know. Also not a super big fan of blisters in the center of the map, but you do still have sleep staffs to deal with them, so I can't fault that one too much. So this one is fine. I don't like I don't like it super much, but I think it's better than a lot of the other maps that we talked about so far. I could see it in A tier. Then we have uh, 24. Again, I think if you have boots, if you really have a lot of boots in people, I think this is an interesting rush to get through. But if you don't, it's probably going to be kind of a slog. And seizing a bunch of thrones with Roy is maybe not how you want to end up, you know, this could have been a way more climactic battle than just fighting a bunch of Manakeets. It is fun to see your units destroy enemy Manakeets, but since it's the only enemy type, it's very binary on, like, your unit selection. Either you have a unit that can kill a Manakeet, or they can do some kind of supporting role, like using staves or dancing, or you name it, rescue dropping maybe. Or they're just worthless in this chapter. Someone like Karel is probably just not good here. <laughs> it's just unenjoyable to use these kind of units. And the lack of deployment means you don't really have a reason to bring units for other than for funsies. And it means bringing a fun unit also comes at the cost of bringing a really good unit, which I don't really like. And in general, this is a very linear chapter. It would have been way more interesting if you had some kind of multi seeds puzzle here than this one-way track that the chapter does. So... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's okay. I still enjoy playing it because the music is epic and it's a nice uh, final chapter. It's it's not really final chapter, but it, it feels like the final chapter because the actual final chapter is so short. It's fine. It's all right. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I can't really get excited over the, the map design itself. Last one is the, the final, final battle. I mean, it's, it's barely a map, so we can probably throw it in bad map call the day. Narratively, I think the way it is makes a lot of sense, but it really is just a one turn clear with Roy. It's more of a cutscene than a battle, so I can't really rate it highly as a map, so we could really put it anywhere and find a justification for it. I do really like Idun. I do really like her. That's it. That's the whole squad. Let me know what you think. I'll see you around. Bye!